Okay, wait, so um, I'm not saying it's gone, I'm just going to do a quick introduction. I just pressed the record button. So today's webinar is titled Managing Vermont's Forest with Endangered Species, Implications of the Northern Long-Eared Bat. Our presenter today is Scott Darling. Scott is a wildlife biologist of the Vermont Fish and Wildlife Department and has been researching bats since 2002 with much of the focus, the recent focus on white nose syndrome. Vermont's national leadership in fighting this critical and implementing this critical research I'm sorry, Vermont's national leadership in fighting this disease includes Scott's membership on the steering committee for the national plan and implementing critical research on post-white nose disease recovery. Scott also serves as an advisor to Bat Wind Energy Cooperative, a national entity committed to science-based research to adjust bat wind energy conflicts. In addition to this responsibility, Scott also serves as a program manager for the department's game species program. Thank you again, Scott, for joining us today. I'll just go ahead and turn it over to you. Thank you, Kate, and uh, thanks to all of you out there. Um, interested in this issue of managing woodlands for state and federally endangered bats. Uh, I, I'd say the overall the, the goals in the presentation today is to give everyone here a little bit of a background on bat biology, uh, explain the federal listing of the northern long-eared bat and this uh, maybe infamous 4D rule, um, offer guidance on managing forests for endangered bats on, on private lands, as well as uh, I hope this is an opportunity to take feedback from you all on, um, on these kind of uh, guidance that I'm providing today. Uh, I think this is a pro progress is moved forward on this, but it really is a work in progress. And so um, comments from those that are trying to apply these kinds of guidelines uh, would be helpful, really. As uh, I'm sure all of you are aware of uh, white nose syndrome, which is a disease from an invasive fungus that has affected bats in North America. Uh, estimates uh, estimates are now around 7 million bats have been killed by this disease, and that estimate is uh, a few years old now, so I suspect those numbers are, are increasing dramatically. Um, to give you an example of the kind of uh, devastation that our bat populations experience in Vermont, you can take a look at Aeolus Cave in Dorset, Vermont, and, and when we typically did winter surveys for bats uh, in this site, um, or white nose syndrome, this uh, corner of the wall here, which is shown on the slide, would be uh, full of more bats than what you see there. But in 2009, we, we took this photo and uh, came back uh, the following um, two years, 2010, those are the number of bats that were there in 2011. That very same uh, corner of the wall and cave was empty. Uh, the cave actually is kind of like the, uh, the best example of the devastation here that can occur at bat populations. And this is a photo of the floor of Aeolus Cave that has uh, tens of thousands of bats on it in 2009. And so, uh, amazingly, uh, what we experienced is a drastic decline in a matter of two to three years in some of our bat populations. In 2010, we actually went and repeated many of the surveys that were conducted since 2002. And the, the goal was to try to determine some uh, disparity in abundance. And you can see particularly highlighted in the northern long-eared bat populations that we, all of our surveys, uh, we had comparable effort, we range from a 93 to 100 percent decline in populations. The other species, interestingly enough, um, that was uh, greatly affected is the left, the little brown bat. So uh, Vermont's got nine species of bats um, and most people are aware of our cave bats, but not familiar with our migratory tree bats. And we've got three of those, and those species of bats literally leave the state in, in winter and uh, migrate south. But prior to white nose syndrome, we had two uh, cave bat species that were state listed the Eden smallfoot bat and the Indiana bat. And those are circled in black here. And the Indiana bat, as you may know, was federally endangered. But as a result of white nose syndrome, three additional species shown in, in the red circles listed as state endangered, and this past April, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service listed the northern long-eared bat as federally threatened. So a little bit of bat biology. Um, all of our bats here in the Northeast are insectivorous. Um, they just eat insects, but they feed on a variety of insects. Um, they are the primary nighttime predator of insects, obviously. But it's also important to recognize that uh, bat is not a bat is not a bat. Um, in fact, bats have very different uh, niches in the environment, particularly when it comes to feeding. I think the best examples are a big brim bat, which is one of our more common bats now, less affected by white nose syndrome, 
likes to fly in more open conditions, um, fields, ponds. Um, but then the northern long-eared bat is a bat that uh, is really built morphologically uh, to feed and fly in what we call a more cluttered environment, denser forest stands. And so that is one bat that really has an edge that's very different than many of our others. The annual life cycle of, um, of cave bats, um, if you take uh, the same time where we are now, our bats are entering hibernation. Uh, where they're going to have to live off your fat reserves for the next six months. And the females have uh, bred uh, with the males already and are storing sperm through the uh, winter. It's not where the uh, you know, conception occurred, they're literally storing the sperm. They come out in mid-April, uh, they initiate pregnancy, and the females fly to the same maternity colony sites, whether it is a house or in the case of uh, the antibats, northern longer bats, whether it's a set of fruit trees, and they um, stay in a maternity colony of other adult females, and in the month of June give birth to one single pup that will become what we call volant or fly in about three weeks' time, and then in very short order, by mid-August, is the onset of uh, fall swarming where bats begin to migrate to back to the caves and breed. So it's a really it's, it's a fascinating annual cycle in that a um, they've got to survive for six months off of fat reserves um, through the winter and B. They literally have to get out, get into their maternity colonies, get in shape to give birth and get those young flying and get back to the cave all in a very short amount of time. The other uh, concept I think is important to understand is this uh, concept of a maternity colony. And the behavior is often called a fission-fusion type of uh, behavior where you would have a colony, if it's Indiana bats, it might be 200, if it's northern long-eared bats, it might be 40 females that are using anywhere from 10 to 15 root trees um, at any point in time during the summer. And there is a primary root tree, which is the tree that they begin to gather in as they get closer and closer to giving birth to their young. Um, but in the meantime, they will move around to these secondary root trees um, maybe switching every two or three days, and so you have this colony of 40 that is spread out amongst 10, 15 trees, and then ultimately, like I said, as they get closer to birth, they begin to congregate in this primary roost tree, um, which really has an advantage to them energetically. Um, their pups are born naked, um, and energy conservation is huge for them, uh, and so that's where they give birth to their, uh, their young. Just to be sure we're all on the same page, roosting is uh, the concept where they, the bats are resting uh, in trees during daylight hours. Um, the maternity colonies, depending on the species, maybe you know, anywhere from 40 to 300 females. We talk about the energy conservation purposes there. I think an important biological concept for people to understand is, is particularly during the cooler days, um, roosting bats may enter a state of what we call torpor to reduce energy consumption. They're basically shutting themselves down. And they can do that voluntarily when things get cold. And when a bat is in torpor, it takes uh, several minutes for it to really wake up and be able to um, react. So the forest management goals um, that I would propose for uh, endangered bats, and really there are two of them. One is to reduce the likelihood of killing or injuring the bats should trees be felled by roosting bats and their pups are present. Um, the second goal is maintain rooting and foraging habitats for bats where they exist. I think particularly with the northern long-eared bat, we have to recognize that um, because of the great declines, um, they're far below their carrying capacity and um, we do not need to put aside habitat for them necessarily. Of course, management practices tend to provide sufficient roosting and foraging habitats. But where the real challenge is from a forest management standpoint is not felling any of the trees while roosting bats or maternity colonies are uh, within them. So I'll quickly go over the Indiana bat, which is a uh, bat we've had some experience in in Vermont. I'm surely most familiar with uh, the biology of this bat because of our work here in Vermont. It is a species that focuses in the Champlain Valley and we knew that from our work from 2002 to about 2008. We are interested in maintaining these two types of habitats. We look at eternity colony habitat, which are the roost trees that are roosting in, as well as the foraging habitat where they feed. 
and how can we can access that diversity of insects that they need. And then the hibernacular habitat, the, the cave of mine that are actually hibernating in the winter. And around that includes roosting and foraging habitat because of what we call this whole swarming period where they're breeding uh, before they go into hibernation. Amazingly so, um, Vermont has some of the densest uh, populations of Indiana bats in the Champlain Valley. And in fact, since white nose syndrome um, hit Vermont, actually a lot of the populations of Indiana bats have at least been stable, if not increasing in the area. And we really can't explain that. So some estimated 6,000 Indiana bats may in fact be close to uh, 7,000, 8,000. Uh, and so forth, if you look at it from a density standpoint, it's pretty, those are pretty amazing numbers uh, for the Champlain Valley. And we uh, developed, the Vermont Fish and Wildlife Department developed the Indiana Bat Forest Management Guidelines in 2009. And those are still available, although we're really looking to upgrade those to include northern long ear bats uh, in the near future. Um, but basically, um, the guidelines talk about avoiding harvesting trees where bats are most concentrated from April 15th to September 30th. And so it's really uh, taking um, uh, some along off the landscape in the Champlain Valley if you want to avoid killing uh, roosting trees. If you do harvest trees in the spring or summer, the guidelines call for retaining potential roosters. Um, while it is important to have roost trees on the landscape or Indiana bats, the key focus here is to retain those trees so that they're not being cut uh, potentially with Indiana bats or the early colonies in them. Northern long-eared bat um, is uh, somewhat different uh, from the Indiana bat in part um, because of its statewide range. Uh, so that it has um, many more implications here. And it's also a whole new issue. It's been a long time since a, a, an animal has been listed federally in, in, the United, in the northeastern United States. And so I think there's a fair amount of uh, anxiety and panic over what the implications are for this listing. Um, this bat is uh, more of a bat of the forest than the Indiana bat. Um, and it, can survive in managed forests for sure, as well as in uh, old growth stands. And really, um, I think one of the key points we always have to keep in mind is that this, this bat is really dependent on the integrity of our forests. And so forest blocks and forest connectivity and dead and dying tree and clean water are all part of, of what um, good forest management practices result in. So I think there should be an awful lot of common ground available here. As I mentioned, uh, it, this bat in particular prefers larger forest patches than the Indian bat. It prefers hardwood sands, wants canopy closure, does not like going out in the open. This is a bat that's built morphologically and behaviorally to fly and stay within our forest. It likes hillsides and ridges, and particularly there's an association with water, and not large bodies of water, but something as small as vernal pools and small streams. Uh, streams, they're still big enough for a bat to fly down through its channel. This slide is often misinterpreted, so I want to be um, very careful about this. This is a slide um, basically of two things. One, where uh, we have surveyed in the state of Vermont four bats, and two, where we have captured northern long-eared bats. And so a lot of people look at this and go, oh, there aren't any northern long-eared bats in the northern Green Mountains. Um, but the reality is we have not surveyed bats there at all. And so um, for the most part, where we have surveyed for bats before white nose syndrome, we have found more than one year bats. And in fact, it probably was our most second, uh, second most common bat before white nose syndrome. So to run through that comparison, um, the Indiana bat limited to that Champlain Valley, the northern long eared bat statewide, you can see the great difference in the number of high macular that these species use. Um, of particular interest is the differences in the roost tree uh, characteristics. The northern long eared bat is not nearly as picky about its roost trees as the Indiana bat. Uh, in fact, diameters as small as three or four inches might be used by northern long eared bats. I think one of the key differences is that northern long eared bats use cabbage trees. And uh, we know that our Indiana bats do not for whatever reason. In the uh, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service listed a northern long eared bat as threatened uh, in April. It also provided what it called an interim 4D rule that attempt to address um, 
harming northern only of western forest management. And with 4D rule, the part of the Endangered Species Act language and it applies to federally threatened species only. If northern longhorned bat had been listed as endangered, the U.S. Fish Wildlife Department could have service could not establish a 4D rule. And these 4D rules essentially allows for the incidental take of threatened species when you follow certain conservation measures. And the 4D rule, it's important to know, is not required if you follow these conservation measures. It basically is an insurance policy that if you do and you happen to incidentally take or harm or kill this endangered species, you would not be in violation of take provisions of the Endangered Species Act. So it's not a regulation you have to follow, and the conservation measures are simply those measures that if you follow those conditions, then you're going to be covered under this, what I call an insurance policy. The 4D rule, the interim 4D rule, proposed, uh, I think, three um, key or activities that would exempt take um, forest management when you applied some conservation measures. And I'll get into those shortly. Minimal tree removal of one acre or less. So anyone uh, going out there to um, treat a small site, a landowner cutting their own firewood, um, all of that less than an acre, any take of more than one year bats would be exempt from the provisions of the Endangered Species Act. Hazard tree removal and another uh, exemption as well. So the conservation measures that were spelled out in the 4D rule um, would be if forest management occurs more than one quarter mile from a known occupied vernacular. And secondly, if it avoids cutting or destroying known occupied roost trees from June 1 to July 31st. And the rationale behind that was that there would be pups who could not fly in those known roof trees and therefore do not cut them while the pups are there and cannot fly. The third provision of conservation measure was to avoid clear cuts within one quarter mile of known occupied roof trees in June and July. So that you could cut, uh, essentially do your clear cuts in May or in August, um, even around known maternity colonies within a quarter mile of those trees. And even under the second stipulation there, you could actually cut known occupied loose trees in August. So the, when the interim rule came out, the Vermont Fish and Wildlife Department felt that there were improvements to it that could be made, and we submitted those kind of comments to um, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. While we surely were supportive of the concept where a forward rule might guide forest management activities and, and uh, provide some insurance for our forest managers and landowners, um, there were issues that we wanted to um, obviously improve for. Um, the first one was the forward rule basically said that no activity would be allowed within a quarter mile of known occupied hibernacular. And so that you could not cut trees um, at any time of year within a quarter mile of these. And a couple of concerns were raised. One is a quarter mile represents only about 2% of the total area that northern long year bats roost in around high vernacular. And we actually felt that um, there was some merit in actually having a um, special manager zone went out further than a quarter mile. And the second concern we raised was actually forest management was uh, within a quarter mile was restricted year round. But we know that bats in Vermont are hibernating from November through March. So why? Why could it not be that uh, landowners uh, harvest trees uh, during the winter time, knowing full well that they were not going to impact uh, roosting of the market bats? The rule also uh, discussed avoid cutting the occupied roost trees in the months of June and July and to avoid clear cuts within a quarter mile of those roost trees. It's important, again, to look at the biology. We know that adult northern longer bats go right to the roost, maternity roost sites, the region. Um, in the earliest mid-April, late April, stay there until the mid to late August, um, they begin to go back to the high vernacular. And particularly in spring, um, in April, May, you get those cool days, those adults, uh, females are going to torpor in the days. Um, we have actually had the telecture at Indiana bats that we're following in very cool temperatures in May to the point where it's made some of them actually die from the cold temperatures. But those bats stayed in Harper and those trees um, for two or three days at a time. 
And um, the second concern is that we do know with a species like that that has such a low reproductive rate that actually it survival maybe is critical in recovering a population that's trying to save the young. Um, and, and the proposal to just focus on pups in June and July didn't seem to be biological correct. So I think at this point I'd, I'd offer it up for uh, questions anyone might have about um, either that biology or the 4D rule just to make sure that we all understand um, what that 4D rule either, uh, seeks or would seek to do. Any, any questions? I guess you can feel free to type in your, your chat. That's right. Thank you very much. Uh, just to remind everybody, you can find the chat box in your control panel. Uh, there should be a header that says chat. Uh, if you click on that, the plus sign, that'll expand the chat box. And then right below, um, you'll see a couple messages that I've typed in, uh, just a welcome message. I've also added some forest management practices, uh, a link to a guidelines on concerning the Indiana bat. Uh, below that, there's a box that should, type, should say something to extend of type here. Um, that's where you go ahead and, and enter your message in. Scott, while, while folks are coming with questions, um, I, one question that did pop into my mind is, can you talk a little bit about how to identify a roost tree or you know, how folks would know if there's a roost tree on the property? Are there some yeah, yes, I'll, um, it's a great question, Nate, and I'll be getting into the details of the kind of characteristics um, that roost trees, uh, that roost trees have. Okay. In short order. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't see any questions. We have in the past had some issues with the chat box. So um, just as an alternative, I am going to go ahead and add a question box um, for folks participating in the webinar. Um, so uh, if uh, your system is allowing for the question box to come in, you may also use that as well. I'll monitor that during the next, uh, um, this next component of the presentation. So please uh, go ahead and just enter questions in as they come up. And uh, Scott, you'll be pausing and at another point to answer. OK, them. great. All right, thanks. I'll, I'll continue then. So uh, we have been working um, within the Fish and Wildlife Department in particular to um, figure out how to respond to land use uh, view um, permitting issues here in Vermont as well as what we were doing on state lands uh, here in Vermont. And one of the um, exercises that will be important, of course, is what kind of guidance we'll get for private landowners. So there is some overlap, but there are also some differences in, in perhaps the uh, expectations um, of uh, the various landowners. Let me start off by saying um, there seems to be uh, it's insane with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service regarding what is unsuitable habitat or northern water bats. And if uh, there are forest management activities that are occurring in what we could consider unsuitable habitat, um, then uh, there no specific measures would be necessary here because in all likelihood the bats are not present on that specific site. So forest stands and then those, those characteristics of forest stands were all tree diameters less than three inches in, in pH. This is an extremely low diameter. Uh, I think more information is going to be uh, necessary to determine whether these are uh, root trees uh, that are used by single males versus maternity colonies. Give an example for Indian bats, we do know that our males will use um, diameters as small as five, seven, eight inches. We know our maternity colonies, particularly as they begin to congregate, are really focused in trees greater than eight, 12 inches in diameter. So um, at this point in time, this is the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service guidance that it's, you know, less than three inches in diameter. Um, there are no, it's not no longer your bad habitat. Forest stands with canopy closure less than 50%. Um, these bats are forest bats. They want uh, Canopy closure, they want something over their head. And so um, if you've got stands that are, uh, you might have shelter woods going in for a generation, um, if you're below 50% canopy closure, you do not need to consider that suitable habitat. Four stands are predominantly spruce fir, and um, any individual trees, very small patches of trees, more than 100 feet from a forest, a more significant forest habitat, um, is unsuitable habitat as well. The other um, condition in which I would think um, any activity can go on without um, fear of harming and killing uh, northern long-eared bats is what I would call uh, this 1% threshold. Um, I'll tell you the U.S. native species that allows for a discountable effect where the risk of take is extremely low. And um, I, th I think there is an, you know, some agreement that, in fact, um, there must be some part of some area that's being harvested that is small enough that it's 
that the odds are so low that another one year that is there. And at this point in time, we have proposed a 1% rule, which is basically if you're taking less than 1% of the horse that have that, um, then a one mile area, which is an area by which a potential maternity colony that exists, that you still have a 99% chance of more than, more than other crops of harm. Now, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service um, has even had discussions about this, and at this point in time, they have rejected this concept. Um, but uh, whether it should be 1% or 2%, I think those are things that need to be thought through a little bit more, because clearly, um, as you see in the next slide, if you have a hibernacular in a completely forested area, your one mile special management zone within which the, uh, the bats would exist, um, it equates to about 2,010 acres. And a 1% rule would enable one to harvest 20 acres um, without uh, any really significant chance of harming the longer bats. That is uh, really too small for most. Um, forest management activities in the state of Vermont, and as I said, whether we need to have discussions about whether that's 2%, it's a 98% chance, sufficient for state and sufficient for U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, those are good things to really have conversations about. But just to show you the significance of the 1% rule is you can go down into the Champlain Valley and where you find instead of, um, you know, 2,000 acres of forest and have that within a mile, it's down to something like 400 or less acres. And therefore, the one percent rule really is, is quite limiting for how much forested habitat can be uh, treated all at once without perhaps uh, passing that ninety-nine percent uh, or making that ninety-nine percent chance of survival. Scott, before you move on from there, uh, a couple questions have come in, um, and okay. this, uh, just one of them in particular is about this. But before we get to that one, the first question is: um, the bat is listed as threatened, not endangered, allowing for the four D rule. Is that correct? That's correct, yes. So it, it's fully uh, listed as threatened, is state listed as a danger, but it's the federal listing as threat that enables 4D rule to be in effect. Right. And then the second follow-up question, um, would that mean that 1%, or sorry, would that 1% mean that 1% of the force per year of hunting cycle, for example, a hunting cycle of 10 years, would mean a 10% harvest, and no harvest for another 10 years? Would that work? Yeah, a great question, and that has come up um, several times when I discuss the one percent concept to people. And you know, we have not taken it to uh, cumulative effects. Um, we're talking strictly about um, the likelihood of bat rooting in a tree that is cut uh, within that one percent threshold. And so, it'd be uh, 20 acres one year, 20 acres year two, 20 acres year three. I hope that answers that question. That, that sounds great. Please, uh, just a reminder, folks, and, and enter any other question to the question box um, as they come. Thanks, Scott. Great. Thank you, Kate. So um, in, in general, besides the if it's not suitable habitat, um, go ahead and conduct forest management as you need. If it's uh, less than 1% or 1% or less of the forested area, um, go ahead and uh, treat the forest as you need to so culturally uh, for whatever purpose. But in general, our guidance uh, for private landowners at this point seems to be focusing on be more sensitive around hibernacular, um, be more sensitive around known maternity colonies, where we know these northern water bats exist. And um, in those cases, avoid felling trees with roots and bats by harvesting trees where bats are hibernating in the winter, or um, in these sites, retain potential root trees and limit the acreage treated to below 60% camp enclosure. Let me get into the of those two points. Retain potential roost trees. Well, it does provide habitat for where those bats exist. It also, by your harvesting them in the uh, summer, that'll be an important element to reduce the likelihood of killing those bats. And I'm making the assumption that where you want to limit acreage, um, or where you want to treat below the 60% can't be closed, you don't necessarily want to be retaining all the potential roost trees, because these include uh, mink call trees, et cetera. So, those are two concepts to consider um, in these areas where we know these bats exist. We currently have in the chart ratio show 23 hibernacular, and I think there's a couple missing this map, but you can see they're scattered throughout at least the, uh, the most part of the southern two thirds uh, of the state. We really don't know of hibernacular in the Northeast Kingdom very much at all, and we may find some over time, but right now 
from surely our hibernacular life is more than southern two thirds of the state. Again, these bats swarm at these hibernacula beginning in mid August and continuing until it's simply too cold. And, uh, generally in mid October, for example, the last cold spot we've had, I sure have tucked the bats away um, for a while here in their caves and mines. From a land management or management standpoint, I mean, the first step is to maintain the integrity of the hibernaculum itself. And so um, this is a slide here of an entrance of a, a cave, and you can see the conditions. It's somewhat open, very rocky. Um, not all of them are like that. But it's really important to maintain the cave airflow, moisture, temperatures, and, and that first setting around it. Um, a, surviving and hibernation of bats is dependent on very narrow temperature regime, they like high humidity, but they can't be flooded out, they can't be washed out. Uh, and they also need that place of that opening uh, high canopy around the site for swarming behavior and breathing. And so um, that's probably where slash, starting water, soil disturbance, all those things I think most of us try to avoid anyways. Um, we'll keep that uh, cave entrance uh, open and uh, available for the bats. I do hope that uh, over time, in the next few, uh, next 12 months or so, we'll be able to contact all the landowners who own hibernacula and to begin to talk about these directly with them. And so our uh, proposals, if you are um, manning forests within one mile of a hibernacula, that to avoid harvesting trees when the bats are active from April 15th to October 31st, and especially for the period of August, um, mid August to October 31st. Um, that special period is really when they are concentrated and focused on swarming around the day. Um, and earlier in the season, the summer, um, April 15th and on, um, there are some single bats that are staying right around the cave area. There may even be a maternity colony within a mile of the cave. But for the most bat part, most of the bats are going further away than that. Um, so it really was critical as that period during all the 15th of the 31st as well. And retain the potential roost trees um, within this one mile. And those trees are exhibiting characteristics of roost trees, and I'm going to go through those. There's three different characteristics that the Indiana bat and the northern land bat use as roosts. Uh, the first uh, characteristic is exfoliating bark. And the picture on the left is a jaguar tree in the Champlain Valley, and that's uh, a tree, whether alive or dead, that Indiana bats uh, frequently use um, for loose. But they also use one with the northern long eared bats, um, loose bark on dead and dying trees. And, um, and I can't uh, emphasize enough how even the smallest piece of loose bark can hold 30 or 40 uh, bats in it. Again, these guys have to pack in. And you know, the temperature um, benefits of being all packed in um, tight under the bark. So you don't need an awful lot of exfoliating bark, but you do need some to meet these characteristics. Second characteristic are crevices. And I've seen these in things mostly in white pines, but there are the trees with these narrow crevices, and literally uh, anything about a half inch a bat can squeeze into. And um, no one on your bets in particular. Very adept at squeezing into uh, tight spaces, they like a roost under those conditions. And lastly, are cavity trees. And what is interesting is cavity trees are not used by Indiana bats. I cannot tell you why, but they are the primary roost tree of more than one year bats. And again, it doesn't necessarily matter uh, what diameter of these trees are, they can go down to very small diameters. But there seems to be a tendency for them to be either woodpecker holes or um, uh, where branches have rotted and, and, and created a cavity hole in the bowl of the tree as well. And one of these bats will not just into the cavity, but into the roost in the bowl of the tree. Most of these um, are really uh, not anything commercially viable. I think we run into issues about um, whether something may uh, have sufficient wood for firewood or whether they become um, essentially has trees on the logging operation. Lastly, I'll put in a uh, plug for retaining large potential roost trees. This is for some uh, FA data that shows you know dead and dying trees tend to fall down before they get too big. And 
where we find our primary roost trees used by uh, Indian bats in particular and or long-eared bats are in our larger diameter um, dead nine trees. And so try to keep some of these trees, whether they be legacy trees, whatever, out of the landscape. Now, I believe an important forest management strategy for a uh, long-term strategy for bats. Um, last week, uh, second to last, because um, we know that bats are using this area, not just northern long eared bats, but even high branching, but little brown bats also use trees in this warming period. Um, when you take acreage below 60% canopy closure, you are making it unsuitable habitat for bats. So just be cautious about how much of that is occurring within the mile of my vernacular. And lastly, um, all those above recommendations become more important the closer you get to the hibernaculum. And so our suggestion is if you're within, in fact, a quarter of a hibernaculum, you really do need to be harvesting those trees in the winter time. And you really need to focus on potential uh, retaining those trees and limiting the uh, amount of unsuitable habitat close to the hibernaculum. And here's our map of known maternity colonies for northern long eared bats. Um, we have decided to select 2010 as our baseline year. Uh, we have an awful lot number of maternity colony sites where we've captured female northern long eared bats before white nose syndrome. But right now we're simply focusing on those sites where we um, are finding adult females, or reproductive females, um, since 2010. I do expect the dots on this map to increase uh, over the next few years. Um, but you can see there's only seven sites right now that we consider on maternity colonies. And very similar to where the high vernacular, um, we've selected this one mile area which where most of the bat roost trees exist in maternity colonies. Not all, but most. And here the, uh, we recommend avoid harvesting trees from April 15th to September 30th. The September 30th date is uh, designed so that we have um, basically, we you know that all of the bats have left to go to the cave. Retain tree, those trees, the closer you are to any known maternity colony, um, the more uh, important those recommendations are. The next is just the rest, the 99% of Vermont that um, simply uh, don't have any information about. We know historically they were there. We need to build up our information base, but until then, um, we're asking uh, that landowners and foresters consider uh, when they can harvest the trees, um, uh, avoid harvesting trees from summer uh, to August 31st. But when September 1st goes, some of those bats have already left. Um, probably not all, but some have. Um, and if you are harvesting trees in the summer, retain potential roost trees, not to maintain the habitat, to reduce the likelihood of taking any of those trees, and limit the acreage where you're just not going to keep any potential roost trees. The more acreage you have where for roost trees being harvested, whether it be for even age management or whatever, um, that just increases the likelihood of take. And um, again, these bats, they use forest to get around, so just keep in mind forest connectivity. If you um, have these narrow belts that are in, in their interconnecting uh, forest patches, um, putting those and regenerating those sites will, in the near term, turn that into unsuitable habitat and restrict movement. Um, Bats. So often one of the questions is, white nose is the problem, why, why worry about forest management? Well, we do know that surviving bats uh, from our little brown bat work may be actually individually resistant to the disease. So these survivors may be very important to the future population. And models show that just by increasing the survivorship of adults just a little bit, you can make dramatic changes in the chances that colony will survive. And our work with little brown bats with homeowners where they um, up in return colonies and buildings. Well, we've been able to demonstrate that we've almost stabilized that population where really we know it exists. So that, that's good news. I think it can work. In time, I think we're going to learn an awful lot more from radio telemetry. Um, acoustic monitoring is a strategy we're using on our public lands, state lands, where um, if we want to harvest trees in the summer, we're going to go out with our bat detectors and we can actually um, identify species and determine whether or not the bats are on the site or not. And if they're not, we can feel very comfortable about harvesting all summer long. I do hope there'll be more forest workshops, development workshops, uh, training on identifying potential roost trees and revision to the forest management guidelines. 
So with that, um, uh, one, if you have any comments, questions, feel free to email me here at uh, this address. Um, and or if you have any questions right now, I think we have a few minutes for that. Great. Thank you so much, Scott. Uh, we do have a few questions that have come in. And um, while I put these out to you, Scott, um, just a reminder for other folks on the webinar, uh, please go ahead and use the question box as part of your control panel. Uh, to submit any any questions, the first question that came in uh, while you were came in a little while ago while you were talking about the hybrid macula, um, how do we know where they are? And if we don't know where they are, is there an answer to retaining and recruiting roost trees? Uh, how, how, mm -hmm. Yeah, the, sorry, <laughs> the follow-up question to that, just to give you kind of a little bit more information, how many per acre should we be targeting? Uh, yeah, oh, very good questions. Um, First of all, we have just um, put the hibernaculum and the one mile um, special management zone buffers on our uh, atlas, uh, which is uh, a site uh, on the UC website if you can access data. Um, I think we'll, we will be going further, which is, as I mentioned, I am identifying the landowners and contacting the landowners. And um, they probably will also be asking if there's a you know, first manager for their property, whether they want us to contact them as well. Um, um, so that is an important step that has to happen, is where are these sites. Um, and secondly, I think the same question was about um, you know, how many root trees should we retain per acre. Um, you know, the Indiana Bat Forest Management Guidelines talk about, um, I think the numbers, if I get them right, are anywhere from either six to eight, it be consistent with the general SAG guidelines that foresters have been trying to apply. Um, and again, the focus so much isn't really on um, trying to provide enough roosting uh, habitat for the species, trying to avoid um, take of the animals. But if you are harvesting in the winter, so you're completely avoiding take, and you still um, then are willing to retain some potential roost trees, I think some, somewhere in that uh, number of peripheries probably where we will fall. Great, thanks, Scott. Uh, another question for you: the concern over summer logging. A crucial strategy in some situations um, is summer logging for re regeneration success. It seems that we should be considering some management strategies for areas that have not already been surveyed for the uh, northern long-eared bat. Should we be concerned in the northern Green Mountains? Well, one of our efforts uh, with the acoustic monitoring is you get a much more significant database of where these bats are. Um, I'll give you an example. I was surprised to hear from my assistant that I think we have already um, surveyed this some almost 100 sites um, through acoustic monitoring. And there's a couple of things that's really important about that effort. One, we will find sites which show some presence of no longer bats, but we'll, we may get a better feel for whether, in fact, these bats remain statewide or are they focused now in a particular area. Uh, to give you an example of how significant this can be, we used to have little brown bats throughout the state of Vermont. And now, uh, with the exception of two colonies, all of our little brown bat colonies are in the Champlain Valley. Um, is this also the case with the long bats? Is there a particular area that they prefer that they have congregated together? Um, so we're, we're going to learn an awful lot more about um, where these bats are in the next three to four years. And I hope that they, if that is the case, there may be areas where the management of our forests and its impacts on northern longer bats are not an issue at all. Um, I know, Kate, was there a second part of that question? No, that was it for that question, uh, but we do have a few more. Uh, if we retain all cavity and potential roost trees during harvest, would that be a good strategy to employ during logging in the summer months? Could that, um, and, and a comment, the follow-up comment would be that would be good for other species as well, I imagine. Yes, that's exactly what I'm asking uh, what we want to do. And um, you know, some of the conversations I've had with foresters, I was out um, a couple of weeks ago with a, a forester on a property. Uh, it was actually a site that had to be logged in the summer. You could not log in the summer. And we were going around marking potential roost trees. And, and I think the key thing is not to spend, you know, we don't have to spend um, many minutes looking at a tree to see if there's loose bark somewhere. If there's obvious cavities, obvious loose bark, and go ahead and retain that tree. And uh, if you're harvesting in the summer, you're basically increasing the likelihood that you're not going to be found trees for roosting past 
Great. Uh, two more questions for you, Scott. You mentioned the use of neural pools. Do you have a recommendation for density or placement when considering use by bats? No, I think, uh, you know, this work was done in Massachusetts, and they basically found wherever vernal pools were, and that is where they particularly got uh, the calls from the long bats. And I can envision what tip, what is happening here is um, the bats come out of their roost, um, you know, they're sitting in a tree all day long in the summer and get pretty warm. They go and drink in vernal pools or pause sites that have the canopy closure, and they have access to water. And so just retaining vernal pools in the water itself um, is important for us. Great. And then uh, one last question. An indication that bats utilize other structure, structures, such as bridges, during the fall swarm? Are they forming caves or mines that may no longer support overwintering bats? Yeah, those are great questions. Um, we know that our use of bridges is pretty limited here in Vermont. They, they will use them for nighttime use, so they're they're out feeding and they want to take a break and digest and just hang out on the bridge. Um, but they don't use those for uh, hibernating or maternity colonies. Um, and uh, what was the second part of that question, Kate, real quick? Uh, um, sorry. <laughs> you know, I just lost it. So uh, if... Uh... Okay. Yeah. Um, so yeah, no, they tend not to use bridges here uh, in Vermont for uh, hibernating or maternity colonies. Great. Uh, just give another second. If uh, there are any other questions, feel free to, uh, to add them in now, folks. Uh, go ahead and, and just use that question uh, box on your control panel. So the question, um, I think you answered part of it. Um, are, are there swarming caves or mines that may no longer support the overwintering bats as they swore, as they're swarming caves that are no longer supporting overwintering bats? Yeah, that, that's a great question. Um, and um, we don't know the answer to that. One of the things we uh, tried to do is to conduct an acoustic monitoring outside some of these hibernaculum. Um, and we obviously go into the caves and mine every two to three years to do conduct surveys. The challenge with living long eared bats, I reference how they like crevices and cracks. They're often harder to uh, locate in a cave or mine because they're, you know, they're stuck in this very fine crack, and all you can see is just this little pink nose sticking in. Uh, but uh, for the most part, we're going to continue to monitor our hypernac to see if they're there. But right now, uh, where we have had evidence of the northern long eared bats, we're still trying to protect the interior of the hypernac and uh, those the, the stages of swarm side as well. Great. Thank you so much, Scott, for taking the time to uh, to share uh, an update on this with us today. Um, it's such an interesting topic. I also want to thank participants. Um, this is an important issue, and I appreciate you, uh, your attention and your participation in the webinar today. So, uh, so with that, um, thank you, Scott. And um, I did want to let folks know our next webinar is scheduled for November 17th, again, at the 9.30 a.m. start time. We'll be hearing from Shannon Morton with the Department of Environmental Conservation on the Vermont Wetland Rules and Cultural Allowances. Uh, as well as best practices. So uh, look for an announcement coming out in the next week or so about that. Please mark your calendars. Again, the next webinar is scheduled for November 17th at 9.30, and it'll be on Vermont Wetland Rules. Uh, thank you again, Scott, for your uh,